Go ahead and take your Bibles this morning. We're going to be over in John chapter number 11 in just a few moments here. John chapter number 11 in just a couple of minutes. While the rest of the United States has been dealing with ice and with snow, uh, we are dealing with the falling of yellow pollen all over the place here in South Georgia. So along with many of you, um, I am struggling right now with my voice and struggling with uh, all this allergies and stuff that are coming up right now. So you pray for me this morning and pray for my voice that the Lord would give me strength as we get through the message time today. Let me ask you a question this morning. I'm going to make you think for just a moment, all right? It won't be too hard of a question, but just, a, just an easy one this morning, okay? What if we knew that God had a plan for everything that took place in our lives. Uh, what if we just knew that God had, but what if we could see on the other side of whatever it is that we were about to face, whether it was a time of blessing in our life or whether it was a time of brokenness in our life? What if we could see the end result and know that God has a plan? Well, your first initial thought and reaction would, should probably be, well, you know, we would know that things would be all right if we could see on the other side of it, if we could see that God had a plan, if we could see that God was working, if we, if we could see that God was going to work in our life and bring about something that was even perhaps hard and difficult, if we could see how He was going to use it, it would be easier for us to go through. Well, the truth of the matter is we may not always see what's on the other side, but the truth of the matter is, is that God is always working. The truth of the matter is we may not able to see the end result, but guaranteed there is an end result that God wants to bring about in our life. Once there was a boy who, uh, as he was growing up, he wanted to have a cool nickname. All right, maybe some of you young guys in here can uh, think about that right now, and you're like, yeah, I just want a cool nickname, you know, something to go by. And uh, he didn't think his name was very cool, so he was hoping to have a cool nickname. So he started going around, and he started telling all of his friends to call him Buck. He said, just call me Buck, that's a cool name. Well, it never stuck, and he never got the nickname that he was looking for. He became a young man, and, and as a young man, one day, he went into a, what he thought was a routine eye check. Uh, he went in, and as he went in, the doctor began to look around and, and look at his right eye, and everything was fine in his right eye, and he moved over to his left eye. And in his left eye, he, he saw a little spot of something. And he told him, he said, we're going to have to go do some more testing. Uh, I'm not sure what this is. So, it, so they went and, and started to do the testing, and they still couldn't find out exactly what was going on. So at that point in time, the doctor uh, said, listen, we're going to have to go in and we're going to have to uh, do some surgery on the eye. He said, if we get in and it's just some sort of a broken blood vessel or something that's in your eye that's causing this spot and that's doing this, he said, when you wake up, he said, you will uh, just have a, an itchy eye and it'll kind of be like a bloodshot eye for a few days and you'll be okay. He said, if you wake up though and it was cancer, he said, you'll wake up without your eye. Unfortunately, or so it would seem to many, that young man who was at the very beginning of his life, as many people would look and think, woke up without a left eye. At that point in time, he had two options. He could either trust the Lord and believe that this was in God's plans, or he could be upset that God would allow him to have lost the use of half of his vision at such a young age. That he would cause him for the rest of his life to have to go about with only one eye. Which path would he choose? We'll talk about that more in just a little bit. I want you to go down to your Bibles with me. Go to John chapter number 11. John chapter number 11 is where you are. I want you to go with me. We're going to begin reading in verse number 1 together. John 11, verse 1, the Bible says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick." When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, 
that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Skip down with me to verse number 11. The Bible says, These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. And then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Can I tell you this morning that just like we're going to see in this passage today, God wants to use your suffering and your pain to bring glory to himself and salvation to the lost. Could I ask you this morning, if right now before we get into the preaching of God's word, would you take just a moment and would you make a commitment to allow the Lord to speak to your heart this morning? Would you make a commitment right now between you and the Lord that you would allow God to work in your heart today? And if there's a trial or a difficulty or something that you are facing, would you commit this morning to God that that your desire would be for Him to get the honor and the glory and the praise and that others might come to know the Lord Jesus because of your testimony of what God has done in your life. I hope that will be your prayer. I hope that will be your heart's desire this morning. Let's bow our heads in prayer and go to the Lord and ask Him to bless our time together. Father, as I come to you this morning, I I pray that you would work in my heart. I pray that you would work in each and every heart and each and every life that's here. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to take the problems and the trials and the difficulties of this life that we are facing. Help us to acknowledge that you are in control of all things and and Lord that you will ultimately be the one that desires to get the honor and the glory and the praise for everything that takes place in our life. May we be willing to go through whatever it is that you have set before us so that we might be a good testimony unto you and so that you might receive glory in and through our lives. Lord, I pray that you'd fill me with your spirit this morning. Fill me with your power. Lord, be with my voice, I pray. And I pray that you would use our time together to be honoring and glorifying to you. And it's in Jesus' name that I do pray. Amen. I want you to look with me this morning and go back to the beginning of this chapter in John chapter 11. I want you to notice, first of all, a foundational truth foundational truth. First of all, look at verse number three with me. The Bible says, therefore his sister sent unto him saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Mark that word lovest there if you mark things in your Bible. Then skip down to verse number five. The Bible says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. This is the foundational truth. Jesus loves you. You say, well, that's really deep and theological this morning. We're starting out with a big one. Yes, it is. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you and you and you and you and and every single one. Paul writes in the book of Romans and, and he says there in Romans 8, 38 and 39, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can I tell you this morning, if you're lost, Jesus loves you. And if you're saved, Jesus loves you. Jesus' love doesn't change for you based on who you are or where you are. He loves you. That's a foundational truth. If we're going to understand the rest of the passage, we have to understand this foundational truth that Jesus loves you. We sing the song with our kids. We sing it growing up, but can I tell you, it's a great song for adults as well. We sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. And we sing the song, we say, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. We say, yes, Jesus loves me. I sing that song with Grayson, and uh, Grayson listens to everything, and he hears it, and, and you start singing the song, saying, yes, Jesus loves me. And he goes, no, 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 Jesus loves me. 
And I'm like, yes, that's what I'm saying. Yes, Jesus loves me. You go, no, no, Jesus loves me. And so I have to sing the song, yes, Jesus loves me and Gray Gray. Yes, Jesus loves me and Gray Gray. Said, yes, that's what, why? Because he wants to say, Jesus loves me. Oh, if we could grab a hold of that foundational truth as a little child would grasp a hold of it, that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Oh, how Jesus loved Mary and Martha and oh, how he loved Lazarus and oh, how he loves you. He shows that here by showing us the purpose of this sickness in verse number four. The Bible tells us that Lazarus is sick. They send to Jesus and they don't, the Bible doesn't tell us everything that they wrote, but it simply says that they sent to him and said, he whom thou lovest is sick because they thought, well, Jesus loves him. And if we just tell him he's sick, he's going to come. I mean, he's healed everybody else. He's done all these other things. Surely he's just going to come and heal Lazarus. Or maybe he'll just speak and heal Lazarus and things will be okay. It'll be fine. We just want to let Jesus know that the person that he loves is sick. Jesus says in verse number 4 that the purpose of this sickness was not unto death. You say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Doesn't Lazarus die? Well, yes, he does, but that wasn't the purpose of the sickness. The purpose went far greater. There was a greater purpose. There was a greater thing. And by the way, uh, yes, he might have died physically, but he did not die eternally at that point in time. And, and so what we see in verse number four, it says, this sickness is not a death, but what for what? For the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Someone wrote and said this, it brought more glory to God for Lazarus to die than if he had been healed. You know, what a wonderful truth that everything that happens is for a purpose. Everything that we go through as a believer is for a purpose. Everything that people that God loves, everything they go through is for a purpose. And the purpose here that we see is that God might get the glory. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 1 and in verse 20, he said, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. It's the thought there that, that the Lord might be glorified, that the Lord might be made known in my body. And then he says this, Whether it be by life or by death. Boy, all that we all could say that this morning. That our life, whether it be by life or whether it be by death, that ultimately God might get the glory for my life. Can I just tell you that if that is our heart's attitude this morning, it will not matter what we go through. It will not, not matter what we face. It will not matter what lies ahead. If our goal is that God might get the glory and we could see that purpose we would be willing, like Paul said, it doesn't matter if I live or die. I just want Christ to be magnified in me. I just want God to get the glory for my life. Can I ask you this morning, are you willing to take whatever you're facing in your life? Are you willing to take whatever trial you're in right now? Are you willing with whatever tribulation you face on this side of glory? Are you willing with the problems and the hurt and the pain that you're going through are you willing to take that right now and say, God, I want you to be glorified in my life? That was the purpose of this sickness, Jesus said. But I want you to notice also, as he continues on, Jesus tells about the power that he has over this sickness as well. Jump down with me. Look at verse number 11. Jesus tells his disciples that they're going to go and that they are going to go into Judea. First of all, notice this in verse number 6. The Bible says that, when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then he says to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. They, I'm paraphrasing here, but they say to him, listen, didn't they, didn't they seek to kill you in Judea? And the Lord goes through and he gives them this, this kind of a thought here. He says, are there not yet 12 hours in a day? You have to walk in the light so that you don't stumble. What Jesus is trying to tell his disciples is that nothing was going to happen to him until his time. Until it was time for him to go to the cross, there was nothing that man could physically do to hurt him or to kill him before his time. And so he tells them in verse number 11, he says, These things said he, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Mark that in your Bibles because this is what Jesus was trying to show them, that he had power over the sickness. 
He's saying, he's, he's asleep, but I'm going to go wake him up. And they go, well, Lord, if he's sleeping, then that's good. Sleep is good when you're sick. That means he's getting rest. That means he can help recoup, and, and his body's going to help recoup itself, and, and he's going to be good to go. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad that I wasn't there for your sakes. He says, but that ye might believe. Look at verse number 15. He says, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Spurgeon writes, he says, We often wonder that the disciples put such poor meanings upon our Lord's words, but I fear we are almost as far off as they were from fully comprehending all his gracious teachings. Are we not still as little children making little out of great words? Jesus is saying to his disciples, I'm going to go and I'm going to heal him. He says, he's sleeping, but I'm going to go wake him up out of his sleep. And his disciples go, don't wake him up. Don't do that. That's bad. Jesus goes, no, no, no. Lazarus is dead. What he's trying to tell them is that he has power to raise him from the dead. And they missed it. They didn't quite understand. Can I tell you this morning how oftentimes we miss what the Lord's trying to do in our life? How many times do we miss what God desires to do? How many times do we miss what Jesus is trying to accomplish in and through perhaps our pain and our hurt and our difficulty? Notice that Jesus not only had a, a, a power over the sickness, but He had a plan as well. Look with me in verse number 6. We read it just a moment ago. It says, He abode two days still in the same place where He was. Look down at verse number 17. The Bible says, Then when Jesus came, He found that He had lain in the grave four days already. To a lot of people, Jesus was four days late. Jesus, though, when He heard of the news, says, Listen, I'm going to stay here for a couple of days. And He doesn't move and He doesn't go. Can I say this? There's never an emergency with Jesus. There's never been a time where Jesus started going, Oh, oh, what, are we, what, what, oh, what, what, what am I supposed to do? Okay, you ever had those moments? <laughs> if you've got kids, you've had those moments, okay? If you've ever had children and you've ever been around children or you've just been around human beings in general, there is an oh no moment in your life. It's like, oh no, don't do that, you know? It's like there's those emergency times. It's like, hey, you got to hurry up and come. Let me ask you, what would you do if you called me and you said, hey, pastor, I just want you to know that my husband or my wife or my child, they, they are very sick. They're at the hospital, and they don't think they're going to make it for long. How would you feel if I showed up two days later or four days later? <laughs> and you found out, well, what, what, what was he doing? No, oh, well, he was just hanging out talking to other people for a couple of days. He just had stuff he had to do, and then I showed up after the fact. See, the way that our minds work is not the way that God's mind works. The way that we think is not what the Lord thinks. The Bible says that His ways are much higher than our ways, and His thoughts are much higher than our thoughts. He had a plan. Jesus knew exactly what He was doing. Even after He hurt, which by the way, He already knew Lazarus sick. He already knew what was going to happen. As God, He already had all those things and knew everything and set it in order. Remember, God does not exist. Jesus Christ does not, He's not exist in our time, so to speak. He is outside of time and He is outside of all those things. And He knew already that Lazarus was sick and He had a plan for it. And when everybody thought, oh, you're four days late. Oh, you should have come sooner. Oh, if you would have been here. Oh, why didn't you come when we called you? Why weren't you there? We look now and we say, oh, Jesus had a plan and what a wonderful plan it was. But don't you and I do the same thing? Lord, why don't you hurry up and take this from me? Lord, why don't you hurry up and get me through this? Lord, why are you waiting so long? Lord, I don't know if you realize this, but you're running out of time. Lord, I don't know, but you're four days late. Don't we do the same thing? Don't we sometimes look and say, what in the world? Where is God? Why hasn't the Lord done anything? And yet God is always on time. There's never been a time where God had to go back and say, you know what, let, let me change that. Let me, let, me, let me reverse that timeline and get back and jump in there sooner. Why? Because God's always on time. He has a plan. And I'm here to tell you this morning, I don't know what your problem is. I don't know what your pain is. 
I don't know what trial you may be going through. There may be something in your life right now that only you and the Lord know about. There may be something that just you and your family know about. There may just be something that you're burdened about and that you're hurting about and that's a pain and a difficulty and you're facing it. And maybe you're saying, Lord, where are you in all this? I've sent for you and you've waited and you've not come. Where are you? Foundational truth, Jesus loves you. If you understand that, then you will understand that God has a purpose for that pain that God has the power to get you through that pain, and that God has a plan for that pain, and that He is going to help you to make it to the other side. Listen, can I tell you this morning that there are many people, there are many believers, and if you're watching this morning, hear this. There are believers that need to stop measuring God's love for you by the trials and difficulties that you're going through and start measuring your trials and difficulties by God's love for you. See, we, we think sometimes, well, apparently God doesn't love me and care about me because if He did, I wouldn't be going through this. Can I show you that the Bible says in verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. The first love that He says, that, that, that they send, they say, He whom thou lovest is sick. There's two different Greek words. The first one that's used is a, is a friendship type of love. The second one that is used is the God love, the agape love, the no strings attached. And it says he loved them, therefore what happened? He waited two days before he came. It's because Jesus loved them that he waited. It's because Jesus loved them that he allowed this to happen in their life. It's because Jesus loved them and because he wanted to get the honor and the glory for what was about to take place. It's because of that that they went through the trial. It's because of that that they went through some of the pain. It's because of that that they went through some of the hurt. And there are people this morning that you're going through a trial, you're going through a pain, and you're going through a hurt, and you're thinking, does Jesus even love me? And I'm here to tell you this morning that I don't know ultimately every single thing that God is trying to do, but I know this, God wants to get the honor and the glory because you uh, and what you're going through, it's because He loves you and He wants you to be able to bring honor and glory to Him and be a testimony to other people in your life. God can take that which is broken and that which is hurting and make something glorious and amazing come out of it. Let's see that throughout the rest of the story. Foundational truth, Jesus loves you. Notice the forever truth, and that's this. Jesus is life. Jesus is life. Look at verse number 20. We'll begin reading. Verse number 20, the Bible says, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. How, how many of you see Martha in yourself so much? Lord, if, you, if only you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. But Lord, I know that you can ask anything and God will still do it. And then she goes on, Jesus says to her, thy brother shall rise again. And she says, yes, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. It's like, Lord, uh, if you'd have been here, he'd have been okay. But I know that you can ask anything. But then Jesus says, that your brother's going to rise again. He's like, she's like, yes, I know at the end of the last day. But she's just like this battle that's going on with it like Lord if you only would have been here Lord I love you but why were you not here and why why did you not help this and I know that you can do anything but why didn't you do this and and there's this battle that's going on within her but in the midst of that battle comes a forever truth and that truth is that Jesus is life she says Lord I know that he'll rise again at the last day and Jesus says to her I am the resurrection and the life in verse 25 he that believeth in me though he were dead yet shall he live and whosoever liveth and believeth than me shall never die. Believest thou this? Jesus starts and he says, I'm the resurrection. I'm the resurrection and the life. In John 14, 19, he'll say, Yet a little while and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians the church was having a problem with the whole thought of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And some were coming along and they were preaching that Jesus had not physically risen from the dead. And Paul writes to them in chapter 15 and verse 20, he says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. 
For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. He says, listen, there is this truth that Jesus is life. It's not, that, uh, it's not that we have life through some other means. It's not that we have to go some roundabout way and, and find life and find out. No, no, no. Jesus is life. To know Jesus is to know life. To have Jesus is to have life. And he says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. She says, oh, I know that there's coming a day. There's going to be a resurrection at the end times and all of that. There will be a resurrection of all. And I know that he'll rise. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I am the resurrection and the life. Notice the requirement. He says, he that believeth in me. He that believeth in me. I'm so glad that he didn't say, he that does enough for me. I'm glad that he didn't say, he that worketh hard for me. I'm glad that he didn't say, he that hath enough money and gives to me. I'm glad he didn't say those things because a lot of people would be left out. But he said, he that believeth in me. A couple months ago, we went and saw some of our family and were able to get together. And, and uh, while we were together with family, the kids got for one of their Christmas gifts, they wanted to go and uh, they wanted to go zip lining. They'd never been before, so a couple of the older kids, I took them and we went. And uh, it was the first time I'd ever been zip lining as well. And uh, we're up there in the mountains and, and zip lining and, and going all over the place and getting ready to anyway. And uh, if you've ever been, how many of you been zip lining before? You know what I'm talking about. Okay, good number of you in here. Okay, so they go on and they hook you up all in this harness and everything, get you all hooked up and and uh, they take you up and you walk up and, and you get to the spot and you get to the cable and, the, and they hook everything on. They show you how it hooks on and they do it for you. And then and, and, and the guy, the, our guide and all that was there and doing all this, um, he gets everything on there and gets it on and, and then says, uh, don't touch this up here like this. And, um, you know, other than that, that's about it. He's like, after that, you just jump. Thank you. Just jump. And sure enough, all we had to do was step off the little edge. You could step off. You could jump. You could do however you wanted to. But you were attached to that cable, and guess what? You just zipped on down through there. Sure enough, his words were true. Just jump. That's all you have to do. You know, when it comes to salvation, it comes to the Lord, it's the same thing. Just jump. Just jump. Not literally, okay? You can if you want to. You can jump, but just believe. People out there today add so much, and they've corrupt the Word of God so much. You've got to believe, but then if you do this, and you do this, and you do this, and you do this, and you do this. Well, believe and believe in Jesus, but then do this and this and this and this and this. No, no, no. When it comes to salvation, it's just believe. <laughs> Believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe what He did. Yes, you must recognize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And then you have to believe on what He did. He died for your sins. For your rotten, dirty, no good self, that's what He died for. For my rotten, dirty, no good self, that's what He died for. That's why He was buried. It's why He shed His blood. It's why He rose again. That whosoever believeth in Him might have life. That's what the Bible tells us. The requirement, he that believeth in me. The result, I love this in this verse. Jesus says, he that though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. This is the forever truth of believing in Jesus Christ, that he is the resurrection and the requirement that if I'll believe, I can have the result that I'm never going to die. I can have that life. I, even though he were dead, Jesus says, yet shall he live. I am thankful that the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is our life. That's what Colossians tells us in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. It says, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Jesus Christ is our life. That's the result of believing in Him. That's the result of trusting in Him and His finished work is that we can have that 
life. That's the result. Notice the reflection. Jesus points right at Martha. Well, I'm sorry, the Bible doesn't say that he points at her. Um, that's just what's going on in my mind as he's talking to her. But he looks at her and he says this, Believest thou this? Do you believe that? It's a reflection. Hey, Martha, pause for just a moment. Reflect upon yourself. And I want you to answer this question. Do you believe that? Do you believe what I'm saying? Do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that if you believe in me, you can have that eternal life and that you'll never die? Notice the recognition that she gives. And she says, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Oh, how I hope every single one of you sitting here this morning and those of you that are watching online right now, I hope that you know and that there has been a moment and a time in your life where you have said those same words as Martha did, not just those same words, but the same drive of what those words have behind them, that yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ. I believe that you are the Messiah. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you are the one who came to die on the cross for my sin and that you were buried and that you rose again. And Lord, I believe in you and I trust that I have eternal life because of trusting in you and believing in you. I hope that you know that in your life. I hope you're not walking around thinking well maybe I did or maybe I have or or perhaps when I got baptized everything came together or I hope you're not sitting there thinking well I've tried to live a good life and I've tried to do all these things no 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 Martha doesn't say yes Lord I think that I've lived a good life yes Lord I know that I got baptized when John the Baptist was doing those baptisms yes Lord I think that I'm trying to do my best and follow you no 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 she said yea Lord I believe that thou art the Christ I hope you believe that this morning I hope you know the Lord Jesus Christ this morning I hope that there's been a change in your life a change in your direction because you know the Lord Jesus Christ a foundational truth a forever truth amen forever truth here's the next part though it's a frustrating truth a frustrating truth and here's the frustrating truth in our minds Sometimes Jesus is limited. In our minds, sometimes Jesus is limited. Notice I didn't just say Jesus is limited because he's not. But in our minds, sometimes he is. Notice with me, go to verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Skip ahead to verse number 32. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Keep reading with me there in verse 33. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. But listen, can I say this morning, Jesus was not weeping. I do not believe that he's weeping for Lazarus. Jesus knew what he was about to do. He knew he was about to bring him back from the dead. I don't think he was weeping for Lazarus. I think he's weeping there because he sees the sorrow of Mary and of Martha, because he sees how much they're hurting. The Bible certainly tells us that we have a, a great high priest who, who does sorrow with us and who does anguish with us in those sorrows. But I think it's also because of the unbelief of all those that are around I think that he, the Bible says that he's groaning that within himself there is a turmoil that is going on here. There is a pain and a, and, and a hurt that's going on in our Savior because after all that he's done, they still limit him. After all that he's done and, and all of what he said that he was and, and, and is still God in the flesh, they're still limiting what he can do. Oh Lord, if you would have been here, it would have been all right. Lord, if you would have just come when we sent to you, it would have been okay. And they come. The Bible says that Jesus wept. Verse 36, Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? There again we see in verse 38, Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. 
Martha just got finished just a few moments ago saying, Yea, Lord, I believe that Thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God that should come into the world. And now here she is going, Don't roll away the stone, Lord, don't, don't do it. It's been four days. He stinketh. Please don't open that door. Do you see how we wrestle sometimes? Yes, Lord, I know, I know who you are. Yes, I believe who you are. I believe that there's life in you. And then just a few minutes later, don't roll away the stone. Lord, he stinketh. Why? Because sometimes in our minds, Jesus is limited. The frustrating truth that sometimes we, 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 we know what Jesus can do. We know what he's capable of. And yet, we don't think he's capable of doing it in our situation. You know, in their mind, Jesus could have healed Lazarus before he died, but, but now it's too late. You know, we know the truth, but sometimes we substitute our reality for the truth. See, their reality was, Lazarus is dead. I mean, if Jesus would have been here before, then everything would have been okay, but, but Lazarus is dead now. There's nothing Jesus can do. Oftentimes, we do the same thing. If I were to ask you a question this morning and I were to say, does Jesus help people with their sicknesses and help them through that? You would say, yes, but there'd be someone that would be sick that would say, yes, but he doesn't help me. If I were to ask you this morning, I'd say, does Jesus help people through their pain? You say, well, yes, but he doesn't seem to be helping me. You say, does Jesus help people through financial difficulties? Yes, but he doesn't seem to be helping me. See, the frustrating truth is that sometimes in our lives, we limit what Jesus can do. And in our minds, he's limited as to the ability that he has. But can I tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ is no less powerful today than he was 2,000 years ago? Can I tell you that God has not changed? If God can raise the dead, uh, and if he could raise the, uh, the widow's son at Nain, and if he could raise Jairus' daughter, he had the same power to do that in Lazarus' life. By the way, I mentioned to you earlier that he waited two days before he went, and by this time it's now been four days. I believe that Jesus waited four days because there was a kind of a superstition and a tradition amongst the Jewish people and, and a first century uh, rabbi wrote, writes about it and tells about it and it was this they believed that uh, for three days that the soul would hover above the grave of the person that was buried and after three days after there being what they thought was after the soul thought was no chance of going back into the body at that point in time the soul would depart for good Jesus waits four days, I think perhaps just out of this belief that some Jews had. Well, maybe, I mean, I mean, Jesus could raise the widow's son at name because he had just died and then he brought him back. And, and you know, Jairus' daughter had just died and he was able to bring her back. But, I mean, Lord, it's been four days. <laughs> Don't open up that tomb. He stinks by now. It's going to be bad. No, no, no. Listen, Jesus has the power to raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus has the power to get you through whatever it is that you're going through. Oh, the frustrating truth is that sometimes we want to limit the Lord Jesus Christ and we think, yes, Jesus is able and God is able, but not in my life. Yes, God can do it, but I don't think he's going to in mine. Yes, God is able and he's still just as powerful, but I don't see him doing it in mine. Hey, wait, you might just be on day three and you need to get to day four. You might just be halfway through and Jesus is saying, just wait a little bit longer. I'm going to show, the longer you wait, the more glory I'm going to receive. The longer you wait and the longer this goes on, the more I am going to show how powerful and how mighty I am in your life. Oh, the frustrating truth is that sometimes we set limits upon the Lord. But I want you to see, even though they had their reality, I want you to see Jesus' reminder. Look at verse 40. This is precious. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Jesus didn't say, why don't you be quiet and just let me do what I'm trying to do? Didn't he have the right to do that sometime? Don't we sometimes go, well, I am so frustrated at people in the Bible. Why don't you just be quiet and let Jesus do what he's going to do? But the reminder that Jesus gives is such a gentle, loving reminder. Hey, didn't, didn't I say 
didn't I tell you that if you'll just if you'll just wait, if you'll just believe, if you'll just trust me, I told you you'll see the glory of God. If you'll just believe and just just give me time. At that moment then, Jesus, in verse 41, the Bible says, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice. You say, why with a loud voice? Because I think he wanted everybody there to hear. It wasn't that Lazarus was hard of hearing. All right? It wasn't that Lazarus needed Jesus to cry out loudly because of how far away he was. No, nothing of that. I think he cried out with a loud voice because he wanted everyone there to hear, to know what he was about to do, so that they might believe that what he was doing was of God. And so he cries with a loud voice, Lazarus! Come forth! I love what one preacher said. He said he had to say Lazarus because if he would have just said come forth, every grave would have been opened and every single person would have started walking out of the grave. But he says, Lazarus, come forth. Come forth. And the Bible says, And when he had thus spoken, cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. I heard one preacher talk about going and taking a trip over in Israel and said before his group had got to the tomb where uh, Lazarus's tomb was there, he had hired an actor over there and had him got dressed up in clothes and had him wrapped up and put a napkin over his face and everything and said they went to this portion and read this scripture. And when he said, Lazarus, come forth, that guy came walking up out of the tomb like that and two ladies passed out right there on the spot. <laughs> Oh, what it must have been like when Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And here he comes walking up out of that grave. And Jesus says, what are you standing right here? Loose him and let him go. Oh, can I tell you the last truth this morning? It's a faithful truth. And that's this, Jesus, he's not only life, but Jesus gives life. Jesus gives life. When he called out to the dead, Lazarus, he says, Lazarus, come forth. At that moment, he starts walking out of there. He gives him life, and then he gives him liberty. He says, loose him and let him go. All oh, the freedom and all the liberty and all the freedom and forgiveness that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, the life that he gives us when we call out on him, as a sinner who is bound in change, as a sinner who is lost and on our way to a devil's hell. But we cry out to the Lord, and he says, loose him and let him go. What a wonderful truth that there's life in the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful truth that this pain that these people went through, this trial, this difficulty, this burden, this hurt, all of it, was for a great purpose, that God might get the glory and that people might come to know Him. I want you to look at this. Don't miss this. Verse number 45. If you mark stuff and write it down, mark down the second word of verse number 45. Then many, then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on Him. What was the purpose of all this? What was the point of all of this? Why the hurt and the pain and the sorrow and the difficulty and the trial and the brother dead for four days? Why all of this? Because many believed on Jesus. Many came to a saving knowledge and God and the Lord Jesus Christ got the glory. And 2,000 years later, as we sit here in church on a Sunday morning, God is still getting the glory and the Lord Jesus Christ is still getting the glory because He is the giver of life. What a faithful truth that there is this morning that Jesus still gives life. Oh, there's some of you this morning, there may be someone that you're sitting in, you're, you're bound in grave clothes still. You're dead in your trespasses and your sin. Maybe you're watching this morning and you're still dead. 
You say, oh, you look at yourself and think, well, I'm still moving. I think I'm okay. We're not talking about physically this morning. I'm talking about spiritually. The day you were born, you were dead. You were dead in your sins and in your trespasses before God Almighty. But the Bible tells us in Colossians 2.13, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. The truth is when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, he makes you alive. He will give you life. And if you do not know that life this morning, if you do not have that life this morning, oh, that you would come to Jesus and you would cry out and call out to him that he might give you life. If you're watching this morning and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're watching out there and you say there's never been a time in my life where I've been, where I've been freed from the chains of sin, uh, there's never a time where I've gotten out of this bondage that I'm in, go to the Lord Jesus Christ, cry in Him now, cry out to Him today, call on Him, confess your sin to Him, tell Him that you need a Savior, tell Him that you believe in His death, His burial, and His resurrection, and call on Him for salvation. Thankfully, that young man that we talked about at the beginning of the message. Thankfully, he decided to trust the Lord for what he was doing in his life. On his way out of the hospital, after having spent a week there and lost his eye, he spent a week there recovering and he left. And on his way out, he, he had a bandage over his left eye. And as he went out that morning, there was a mom who was coming into the hospital with her little boy. And as he came out uh, the door and they met each other at the door, the little boy said, Look, Mommy, they have pirates here. And the mom hurried up and grabbed her kid and took her away, as all moms would do, and hurry up and pulled him off to the side. He went to church that next Sunday and had a patch over his eye. There was a young man that was about five years old, and I say young man, but a young boy that was about five years old who was a really good friend of his, and, and he would run up to him. He ran up to him, and he said, where have you been? And he looked at him, and he said, whoa, what's that on your eye? And he said, well, it's, it's a patch. He said, it's kind of like what a pirate would wear. And the boy looked at him, his eyes got really big, and he said, whoa. He said, are you a pirate? And he said, well, he said, I, I guess... He said, I guess you can just call me Patch the Pirate. And over the last 30 years, Patch the Pirate, as he's affectionately known to tens of thousands of people all over the United States and all over the world, has written music and has written stories and plays and been instrumental in one of the biggest names in Christian conservative music in the last 30 years. As a matter of fact, we use their music here. We use their music for our vacation Bible schools. They've been instrumental in, in my life and now in my children's life. And further on today, they, the Lord still continues to use him. Even though now he is elderly and he has Alzheimer's and uh, doesn't remember a whole lot, but there's still the joy of the Lord in his life. And God is still working and using His testimony even in my life today. All because He chose and He said, Lord, I'm not going to look at this as you being mad at me or you not wanting to use me, but I'm going to look at this as an opportunity for the Lord to get the glory. The first song that He wrote after losing His eye was entitled, O oh, Rejoice in the Lord. The song reads like this, God never moves without purpose or plan when trying his servant and molding a man. Give thanks to the Lord though your testing seems long. In darkness he giveth a song. Oh rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried, and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Can I tell you this morning, God wants to use your suffering and your pain to bring glory to Himself and salvation to the lost. Jesus loves you. Don't forget that foundational truth. Jesus is life. Don't forget that forever truth. 
Jesus is not limited. It's a frustrating truth that sometimes we make him that way and point, seems to be that way. But there's a faithful truth, and that's that he still gives life. Don't forget that this morning. Listen, if you're watching and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, or if you're going through something this morning, whatever the pain, whatever the difficulty, will you take it to the Lord? Will you give it to him? Will you say, Lord, I just want you to be glorified. Lord, I just want you to get the glory. Every head bowed and every eye closed for a moment this morning. Christine is going to come. She's going to play that song this morning. Oh, rejoice in the Lord.